1969, at the Tucson Tenure Mineral Show, I met both Jim Blease and Dick Graham for the first time. Now, it took me about a year. I mean, bear in mind, I'm only 16 years old at this point. It took me about a year to be able to separate the two. Um, and since that time, uh, I have had the honor and pleasure of spending a great deal of time with Dick and sucking him and trying to like, for information about the history and the minerals of Bisbee. And so when we were laying out the, the museum and we had this idea of putting a, a scope recreation in it, of course, you know, the, the Grams were the first ones that we talked to because Dick was on the advisory board, as I was, and Will Wilkinson and, and some others. And there was no hesitation. You know, Dick was more than happy to volunteer his two sons. To help. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who had not made it that far, you're in for a real treat. It is the largest and finest recreation in existence, and this is the third one that you guys have done. That's correct. Okay. So I first uh, visited their home about 1974 or 75. So these these guys were just rugrats. Not quite, but pretty close. I remember distinctly talking to Dick. And he mentioned this was about the time the mines were closing, and he was bemoaning the fact that all of these hippies were moving into Bisbee. <laughs> and he said, well, I think we need to reinstitute the Bisbee deportation agency. <laughs> and the first comment out of my mouth was, well, why do you need to deport people? I think they want to leave Bisbee on, on their own. <laughs> Dick took that in great stride. Your mother, if looks could kill, we wouldn't be having this conversation. She was not as pleased with that statement as, as your father was. So fast forward. As we all know, you know, Dick left us just a few months ago, and we're all very sad about that. But just know that he saw the, the, the museum, he saw the, the scope as you see it today, within just a few days of his passing. That's right. Correct. Now, these guys were so enthralled with the rest of the museum, they didn't notice. But one of his daughters-in-law told me that when he saw that, it brought tears to his eyes. That's how good that scope recreation is. So please enjoy it. We are also, the friends and family of, of Dick, are putting together 14 tribute cases that will be at the 2022 Tucson Gym Mineral Show. Uh, some of you in the audience are involved in that directly. Many of you will be involved by contributing specimens. And I've been very pleased with the reaction. Every single person that I have asked, it was just an immediate yes. Tell us what we need to do. And, and so between Rich and Doug and Mark A and myself, we're, we're spearheading that. During lunch, out at, next to the, the quartz crystals specimen, we'll have a table set up and they will be selling their, their, the first two volumes of their three volumes set. Exactly. And approximately half of the proceeds of that sale go to benefit the Flag Mineral Foundation and the two U of A museums. And, and for that, I'm, I'm very pleased that, that they liked my idea and actually <laughs> followed through with it. When I said, you know, the two U of A museums and the Flag Mineral Foundation, I think that one of them had a little question on their look. And I said, look, you know, we know about the two U of A museums, the Flag Mineral Foundation, I'm chair of the board, it's my idea that I'm bringing to you, so bear with me, all right? So any, any of those sales will, will benefit those, those three groups. So we do have the pleasure of having both of them here this morning to talk a little bit about the mineralogy and mines and probably a bit more of a tribute to their father. Great and done, Grant. Good morning, uh, this is my brother Richard, I'm Doug, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a brief overview, very brief overview of geology, mineralogy, a slight touch on mining at Bisbee, Arizona.
Uh, we got into this uh, through our father, as you guys probably know. Um, he started collecting minerals in Bisbee in the early 1950s. Uh, he later started working in the mines and then finally ended up being a geologist there, working both in the open pit and the underground divisions. My brother and I, we started collecting uh, minerals in the early 1970s. But it wasn't until the 1980s, the middle 1980s, um, that we, our focus kind of changed a little bit. And this was actually because of field collecting in a large part. I know we got a lot of field collectors out there and, and you'll be able to relate this. You're trying, when you're out in the field, you're looking for hints and clues on where to, to pursue your efforts at. And a lot of it is structure, chemistry, and geology. And so we started collecting minerals that tell mineralogical stories. Ones that show, ooh, this shows different deposition. What is going on here? Then in the 19, 1985, um, we hit a, a mineral locality with my father, my grandfather, and the bro my brother and I, of cuprites. Some very fine pieces came out. Super interesting area. Material only weighed two tons, which was right around a cubic meter of material. But in that cubic meter material, 27 different mineral species. When you break the boulders open, you could just smell the chlorine. Oh, it was just, you knew that there was a story in there. And working with Dr. Sid, Dr. Sid Williams, who did all the analytical work, it just kind of pushed us down this road. Now, uh, Bisbee, for those that don't know, it's, seven miles north of the Mexican border and 25 miles south of uh, Tombstone, right down over there, in there. Um, best known, come on, best known for copper mining. Uh, but most people don't realize that the initial discovery, even though it did take pl place in 1877, it was, they found cerusite float, a lead carbonate. And the people that had discovered it, keep in mind that Tombstone had just been discovered, you know, the big silver mine, they realized the association with silver and lead. So that was the driver on got, that got Bisbee developed. Now, the first of the major mines developed is the Copper Queen. Now, this is, photo was taken in 1897, this is 10 years after the Copper Queen mine actually closed down. The Copper Queen mine actually ex it is just this open cut here, which goes down about 300 feet into the ground. And this little building right there, which is the hoisting works, which is an inclined shaft that parallels the open cut. And this shaft was used to service it. Now, Bisbee ends up being one of the largest underground mines. It has 2,200 miles of underground workings and has two small open pits on it. Come on. Let me try to hit. Am I in the way? Yeah, it's not. Here. Come on. Is it doing it? No, oh, there it goes. Oh, forgot about this. This is an example of cerusite coated in minium. This is, came from just above where the initial discovery was hit up on Hendricks Gulch. Ah, metal production. Now, metal production in Bisbee. Lots of mines produce more than one metal. Where Bisbee is special is actually on the quantities that it's producing. We produced almost 8 billion pounds of copper. As copper goes, mines go, we're about seventh in Arizona, but we're, we're important. Silver production, 102 million ounces. That Bisbee ranks as the 10th largest silver mine in the United States. Uh, of course, largest in Arizona on that. Uh, there was a time Bisbee pretty much stopped mining copper and they switched to lead zinc production right in there. The manganese was pretty much only mined during World War I. With the large quantities of the metals, you can start getting an understanding of the complex mineralogy that Bisbee has. Geology. And we're going to stay pretty basic on this. Um, 
about 200 million years ago, uh, we had an intrusion, and it's right in there. You can see this, the orange co uh, coating is a Gaussian cap or an oxidation cap over the copper porphyry. Um, this, this intrusion uh, breaks up the ground and is followed by uh, four episodes of mineral bearing solutions coming up. Now, not only do they come up along through the, the porphyry and the breaches in here, they also enter the limestones right here and they put in limestone replacements right through here. The town of Bisbee is sitting right up here. The open pit line right here, which is a lavender pit. This area is the Holbrook extension. And when it went up, it actually mined into the uh, old oxide workings inside the limestone, the super gene right up in there. This is mostly porphyry, breaches, et cetera, that they're mining. One important structure that we're gonna be talking about today is the dividend fault. It runs right in through there. Come on. There. There you go, Rich. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of fun. Um, just real quick, I know you probably can't read it, uh, but there are 337 species, uh, not including things that have been discredited. They're noted because if you're doing research on Bisbee, you're going to find things, uh, references to Braunite too. You're going to have biotite, as we discussed earlier, in the references. So they're mentioned, but they are not, in and that they show up on the list, but they are not included in the total number. The last two species were identified by Mr. McGlossen and uh, they're Tangiite and Nambite from Bisbee, uh, which was nice, and that was in July. So the work on Bisbee is continuing, uh, which is nice. Um, let's go here. Okay, so hypogene mineralization. Right now, <clears throat> there are four distinct episodes that have been identified. Now, there are possibly more, it's just the evidence hasn't been seen yet, or it's been wiped out. In the first uh, episode of mineralization, it was largely pyrite, um, sulfur, or it was iron, sulfur, and silica, okay? Now, in many ways, the most important thing it does at this point is when the solutions came up along the intrusion, it shattered the ground, uh, sort of like spokes coming off of a wheel, putting in some pretty good sized faults. Um, then it deposited 500 million tons, well, over 500 million tons of uh, pyrite, okay? And it also solidified the intrusion, uh, which made it partially impermeable for later uh, mineralization. Then in the second episode is when the copper minerals largely got deposited, and that's where we get all excited, uh, not in the sulfide section, but later on when they alter. Uh, so you had an iron sulfur episode coming in, and it uh, came up, and it didn't do much in the actual intrusion itself because it had been silicified, but it went out into the limestones and made uh, limestone replacement ore bodies. You find them uh, around the large uh, ore bodies, uh, not ore bodies, but bodies of pyrite that had been deposited and occasionally inside them. Then the third stage uh, was the lead zinc stage. Now, when the lead and zinc got deposited, they tended to be deposited out in the limestones <coughs> away from the uh, pyrite, calcopyrite. Not always, but normally they were some distance away. Uh, just out of curiosity, the, the pyrite crystals is 800 level coal. We have uh, the calcopyrites from the Campbell mine and the uh, galena here is from the junction. And then the exciting thing, and it's hard to see, it's just a real pain to photograph an altite, uh, but that's from the fourth stage, and, and for most of you, that would be one of the exciting stages, because that's when the rare, uh, rare elements came in, your tellurium, your vanadium, uh, your gold, your silver, uh, your uranium got dumped into the system, and so that provides uh, a lot of opportunities for research. 
because unfortunately, <clears throat> sulfides typically have been saved from the Campbell injunction, but in like the Czar, Holbrook, and those areas, which also had large sulfide deposits, few specimens um, have been retained, and I'm as guilty as anybody. I was on the 200 Czar and saw pyrite and never took it, because <laughs> it was pyrite. Uh, and probably chalcopyrite at the time. Uh, and uh, we have 100 uh, species that have been identified uh, that are, um, no, yeah, uh, that are uh, of hypogene or origins. Okay, and let's get to the super gene, because that's where all the beautiful minerals, because I, if you've ever tried to collect Bisbee sulfides, they're uh, if you can find a visible crystal, that's an achievement. Yeah, uh, looking at hundreds of samples of Bisbee sulfides, uh, anything that is not microscopic uh, is extraordinary, okay? And uh, to make it easier to understand, what we did is we, um, can I borrow your pointer, Doug? Sure. Uh, is we divided it into four sections. We have this eastern section, which includes the Campbell Mine, which um, is probably one of the more important, when, and the junction. And this eastern section received two episodes of supergene activity. The middle section and the southern section appears to have seen only three, or three. And then, uh, and the coal is the big mineral producer down, down in here. Uh, and then we have the western section, which many of you have specimens from uh, Czar, Holbrook, Southwest. It appears that it received four episodes of supergene enrichment. Mm. Uh, there is some overlapping, and that's because of depth, okay, the, the tilting. So in the mid area, the upper levels of the junction, okay, uh, and upper levels of the Sacramento possibly saw three. Okay. Or Sacramento, I'm at four. Okay, Rich. Ah, stage one, supergene enrichment. It takes place in the late Jurassic, early uh, Cretaceous. Uh, the paleoclimate at this time is allowing near surface waters and surface waters. So we've got high water tables. Uh, the supergene enrichment that you're going to see is almost all subaqueous, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, the rock beds have not been tilted, so they're still flat lying. The ore is close to surface within 30 meters and goes down to 400 meters at this time. Um, in the areas that are subaqueous, or uh, yeah, subaqueous underwater, we're starting to get large crystals to develop. This one right here is from the 2200 level Campbell, the large spinel. It's about four inches long. Uh, where did I put? Oh, there it goes. Also, difficult. There it goes. This time, large azure, azurite crystals were developing. Uh, as you can tell, they all pseudomorph to malachite. Uh, this particular one's uh, from the 1300 level uh, Campbell. Uh, these are the pseudomorphs that all have the sharp tips on them. So these are from that first stage of supergene enrichment. <clears throat> now, we had two areas that did not see a lot of subaqueous oxidation. And that was in the Czar area, which is up near where Bisbee is at. And we had some on the, where this piece is coming from is the 770 junction. Both these areas were protected by clays and oxidation material, oxides on it that kept from doing it. One thing in the upper level Campbell and junction that you'll find uh, today is you'll, you'll, you'll hit these pockets of malachite and you'll see stalactites in them and they're pitched at an angle. It's because those grew before the tilting of the beds and then they got tilted up. Uh, so they're really kind of cool when you find them. 
second stage super junior enrichment. Now this one's gonna be pretty mild, guys. As you can see, it, it, it happens in the middle of, middle of the Cretaceous. The dividend fault has dropped a thousand feet on the south side. Um, bed's been tilted a little bit. You get copper and cuprite uh, deposited in protective clays. At this time, the Bisbee Manco Sea is in the area. And we're believing that the brackish waters of this is the source of bromine, uh, chlorine, and nitrogen in uh, the mineral system. Mm. Overgrowth. Oh, yeah. The most distinctive thing for mineral collectors for, for here is you'll find these uh, malachite pseudomorphs, azurite, that have these bright, brilliant coatings of azurite. So these are what are developing at that time. The ex ex Okay. So if you have a, and they're very popular with collectors, you have a large azurite crystal that has that second generation overgrowth. That second generation overgrowth appears to have formed during the second super gene uh, stage. Now, by the time the third super gene uh, episode occurs, the Campbell and Junction areas are buried fairly deeply and are largely protected from any further activity. Um, but the middle and um, western sections and some parts of the, the southern sections are they're being tilted. You remember we have the Laramide going on and then the Basin and Range. And uh, so the beds are tilting uh, during the Miocene and you're seeing again um, some super gene activity going on in a pretty intense amount. Okay, this is a or malachite and azurite. It's from the Freeport collection. It's a, a pretty good sized piece. That's from the Holbrook uh, mine. You have another azurite from the Holbrook mine. Um, fairly deep, you know, for, for this section of the district. They're looking at, you know, the 300, 400 levels. Um, and then we also were getting uh, Cuprite, and this one's off the 400 levels R uh, with a little bit of uh, calcite. This was also uh, uh, forming at this time. One of the things that, although we did not determine the fourth stage, because most of these were, were determined with, you know, there are tons of people that are doing work on, on Bisbee mineralization. Um, but we just interpret it a little differently. Uh, well, we, we looked at it in the mineral aspect, not the geologic or the mining aspect. Okay, the fourth stage is really new. It occurred that the Allianite dating puts it at, what, nine million years ago? So it, it's, it's brand spanking new as far as geology is concerned. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is we have the, um, we have the dividend fault, which we looked at on the map. And the dividend fault, uh, in this area, its widest point is about 300 feet, if I remember correctly. And we're getting these copper solutions and um, they're coming into the uh, non-reactive clays along the foot wall, okay? And they move over towards the hanging wall and the hanging wall has carbonates. So, uh, and the copper solutions are reacting with the carbonates and forming the azurite roses. The really classic ones, uh, Anna showed one earlier, a nice big one, okay? These all came out of the dividend, uh, ore bodies along the dividend fault, um, and they formed, and they're fairly young uh, by uh, mineralogical uh, thoughts. So uh, this was occurring, and maybe less exciting, um, it, it really oxidized the western part of the district pretty heavily. So the upper parts of the district, like the southwest mine, you're not going to find wonderful azurites typically, or even large amount of cuprite. Uh, they've been oxidized away. Uh, you're pretty much list, left with a lot of acicular malachite and iron oxide, oxide box work. Um, also, the caves formed at this time. And let's go to here. This is probably the most famous one because it's the only one that's left intact, really. Uh, this formed as the result of the oxidation of a body of iron or pyrite. So it 
there was no reason to mine it. It's just, just <gasps> iron sulfide. Typically, these formed on top of ore bodies. And so um, they would be a lot prettier if they formed on top of an ore body because you would have, you know, they would be colored green and hints of blues. And uh, often <laughs> the floors of the cave contain substantial azurite and malachite. Uh, in, in rarer cases, almost entirely. But since that was ore, that was removed, okay? Now in saying that, and I'll go back to the last slide, when you saw that azurite rose, when they were mining the, that area, that is probably the only time that we can determine that good specimens were actually being shipped to the smelter. Uh, normally, uh, miners would have taken the specimens because of the financial value. Okay, Bisbee specimens were always expensive. Okay, and it was a great way to increase your wages. And there was a great marketplace at the bars and the restaurants for those. Uh, so, but with the azurite roses, they had so many of them at the time and they became underappreciated. So they were just shoveling them into the chute. You know, they would take what they wanted and off they went. But that is probably the only time that we can determine anything that was identifiable as a good specimen. Now, um, I didn't collect any off the 200 czar or the 200 czar to the over into the Holbrook because that area had been mined out before I was very old. But I did a lot of work at the uh, collecting azurite roses in uh, Hanover, New Mexico. And then I did a lot uh, at the copper rose mine not too far away. Far away. And when you collect an azurite rose, it's they're very evident what they are typically. They're very pretty the moment you collect them. They have a little clay on them, but they typically are very pretty. And this is the over 210 uh, species that have been identified uh, that are um, super gene origin. You'll notice like this one, Bronite too, that italicized in quotes indicate that it is a, a discredited species, but we, Keep it in the list just to make sure people know it, and then there's, we, we make a note of that. And then what is the other? Stibkinite, there's, uh, uh, we use glossary of mineral species. That's how we use our guideline, and if it's questioned by them, we question it too. Is this one for you? Oh, oh I'm post-mining too. Now, post-mining minerals, uh, we have been paying a lot of attention to them lately, even though underground areas like this are extremely unpleasant. Uh, and they probably form the dominant areas where post-mining minerals are occurring. This is a, a crosscut going out on the, in the Wolverine country on the seven level of the Southwest. And these grow remarkably quickly. I imagine they're only a couple months old. Uh, and they're just the iron hydroxides forming. You get ferrocopiapite and epsomite and, and a whole slew of interesting but not necessarily collectible species. Um, the only post-mining minerals that get uh, much attraction is the, um, the calcite or the aragonite. Uh, and this one right here does have some calcite. It is largely aragonite and that pretty much is aragonite. Uh, this bucket has been sitting there 70, 70 years with water dripping in it, and there's about four inches of, of calcite in the bottom of that thing. I just think it's, it's interesting to look at it sometimes. Uh, someday it will be a really interesting specimen. Um, bird's nests like this, or quote-unquote bird's nests, are actually really rare. They, you see them occurring all the time on the floor of the drift, but typically underneath the eggs, quote-unquote, it's very thin, and so when you lift it up, it just breaks apart. This one came from the Campbell, and it's odd. It's, it's over, its thinnest section is about a centimeter, so this one's really thick. Uh, yeah, they're very popular, but extremely rare, really. Uh, although you do find them underground, they're just not collectible. Uh, malachite and azurite did form, and actually the malachite is actually fairly abundant. Uh, and some of it looks beautiful, because I remember as a kid, my dad had a, uh, a specimen of banded malachite that looked like it had come from the lavender pit, and there was a track spike in it. Yeah, I, I wish he had kept that. <laughs> it was just really cool. Azurite, for, it, the conditions to form azurite are just a little bit more challenging. There's only one area that I've been to that I honestly felt 
azurite was being formed and could, could, could prove it um, because of the high CO2 pressure. If you see azurite growing, then you probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, you should be dead. Uh, but we had an area that was sealed behind a cave-in with a large amount of flowing water going into it. So we believe that might have raised the CO2 pressure high enough that uh, the azurite formed and then it was definitely post-mining. Um, but why it formed was, is, 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 is weird. But it was sealed behind a cave-in, a massive cave-in. Um, and uh, it appears that when they reopened the cave-in, it allowed access, but it also dropped the uh, CO2 level. It's caved in again, so it could be still active. Hey, Doug. Oh, turquoise. Ah, turquoise. Bisbee's famous for it. Um, I know, slap dairy rock, guys. I'm not a big fan either until I learned the story of it. I actually like the formation of it. Um, super, super popular and very well marketed material. This is why I find turquoise fascinating. This is a shot of the lavender pit. The viewpoint is about right there, guys, uh, where you're looking down into it. What's going on here is in the late uh, Jurassic, early Cretaceous, a canyon was cut right here, heading to the east and uh, through the Naco limestone. And then it got filled in through cl with clast, uh, forming the uh, Glantz conglomerate. It's pebbles made up of various rock types eroded from, old, from where Bisbee is downward. Now, after it got filled in, we have the granite porphyry and the copper deposits, so hypogene over here. The solutions, the rainwater and all that stuff, is carrying in your aluminum, your phosphate, and your copper. And it's when it enters the, the old fossil canyon, it starts to precipitate out. And the turquoise is actually replacing the little pebble nodules in there. Most of them are limestone in there. Uh, I saw one the other day that was a little of a volcanic rock that's getting replaced. And it's also filling any void spaces, especially in, this has got a bunch of little hydrothermal uh, quartz veins running through them. And all the little quartz pockets are just filled full of little turquoise. Uh, you know, most Bisbee turquoise has all hit the rock saw. <laughs> Uh, so if you've got a good piece of rough turquoise, they're not that common anymore. Now turquoise is kind of odd. It's fairly deep in Bisbee. We don't even get turquoise until you're 60 meters down. So about right there, about 200 feet, guys. And you can see how deep it goes down there. The bottom pits right there. So you're looking about, uh, about 500 foot right at that point. Yeah. There. Um, that indicates that, that there's no turquoise from Bisbee that's older than the 1950s, early yeah. 1950s. Yeah. So if you have something that has a Bisbee turquoise and it says it's 1930, uh, <laughs> it's either not Bisbee or it's newer. It, it, it's a newer piece because 200 feet down, they had to hit it with the pit. And they hit it about, they probably hit the first stuff somewhere around 1953, but they didn't really pay attention to it because... Uh, you had this blue chrysocolla looking stuff, and then you had the wonderful azurites coming out of the Campbell Injunction of that time, of the 1900. There wasn't a lot of uh, competition. So uh, we are continuing work, uh, following our father's work. He, uh, well, we agreed that we wanted to continue it with a mining history as it applies to minerals uh, and do a mineral collecting history, and that will be in volume three that we are working our, uh, with um, Dr. Carl Francis from uh, the former um, Harvard. Harvard. Uh, doing the review. Is doing uh, our, our review work. Uh, we worked on the other one so long, Dick Badeau did some of it. <laughs> yeah. Did the review. That was yeah. his last big project. Yeah. Yeah. On that. Yeah. So we're, we're slow on this stuff, but this one won't be that slow. It's about half written. Yeah. Uh, we're just arguing among ourselves because, you know, there's so much that needs to be done, like analyzing 105C. Okay, that's a huge, many of you own the specimens from the, the Campbell 105C stopes. You may not know what they, 
identify them as that, but they're beautiful malachite pseudomorphs of azurite. Some nice uh, azurites came out of 105C, or like the cuprite and calcite on the 400s are. Um, we want to address those in, in detail. Uh, yeah. And the writing's not the problem. It's Camera and I are not friends. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it at that. Uh, one other thing that we're going to be doing is mineral labels. Um, learning how to interpret the, mine, the mining end of the labels. Uh, Harvard has a fantastic collection of, of uh, labels. And just learning what a floor, what, what, what a mining term means by floor, what they mean by level, what crosscuts, what the numbers mean, et cetera, will also be part. In three. And, and I guess we find that important is because um, like the one, Campbell 105C stope, there's still a, a huge number of specimens there. They're, they're a couple, well, they're 1,500 feet underwater probably right now, yeah. uh, but they're packed in clays. They should be fine. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, the Uncle Sam and, and many of these areas are still are going to be major specimen producers, just that time has to pass. Okay, it's just, we just, it, you know, until we can figure out a way for mineral collectors to pump that kind of water <laughs> economically, yeah, we're going to be sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. But, but by recording that information, somebody someday is going to have a really good time. <laughs> <laughs>